Uh, it's good to be back among the people and to have the ability to talk about the Lord and His Word. And um, I'd encourage you to start with me in your Bible in the book of Galatians. For the first of what I think are two lessons, over a phrase that occurs in Galatians 2, Peter was known, although a lot of translations say Peter stood condemned, it actually says he was known, he was known, as in he was figured out, he was exposed, it was clear what was really happening. And uh, I wanted to take the first opportunity talking about this to look at uh, the connection to what happened in Acts chapter 15, which is we're going to look at now and establish, which is the background for Galatians 1 and 2 that Paul writes. The big picture is that it, there's a warning that, that Paul is putting out for them and for us who are also recipients of this letter, of course. Uh, as you look at his letter to Galatia, it has a fairly straightforward governing theme, which is that they should cut off false teachers and that they should beware following personalities instead of following Christ. Which turns out is uh, very useful to moderns as well. This is for us to take to heart, not just for them. We also have to be sure that we are preventing error from being taught and that we are also on our guard against being influenced by personalities instead of the doctrine of Christ. And these are uh, the principles, I would say, in Galatians 1, uh, verses 6 through 10, probably, I think, probably the most famous part of the letter, perhaps most often quoted part of the letter. These are the principles, though, that guide the rest of the letter, and especially the second chapter. But... I think it's good for us to start with a simple statement of the principles. You know, here is the truth of what God wants. This is what he's writing to Galatia. And it comes first because it does set up the rest of what's being said. So, you know, you find there in verses 6 through 10 of Galatians chapter 1, Paul writes to the church there, I'm astonished that you're so quickly deserting him who called you in the grace of Christ and are turning to a different gospel. Not that there is another one, but there are some who trouble you and want to distort the gospel of Christ. But even if we or an angel from heaven should preach to you a gospel contrary to the one we preach to you, well, let him be accursed. As we said before, so now I say again, if anyone is preaching to you a gospel contrary to the one you received, let him be accursed. For am I now seeking the approval of man or of God? Or am I trying to please man? If I were still trying to please man, I would be no servant of Christ. These are the principles that are governing this. And if you look back over them, there in the seventh verse, he said, you know, well, six and seven. You seem to be turning to a different gospel, not that there is another one. Saying there isn't really a different gospel. It's fraudulent, what they're turning you to. And this calls out something that needs to be said, that truth is absolute. Truth exists, and truth is knowable. And there's only one truth. You hold to the truth or you don't. And those who are teaching that he's writing about among the church in Galatia, do not have the truth. What they're teaching is a different gospel. And Paul's astonished that they're turning to that so quickly, too. It's not the real gospel, uh, in fact, although there is one and there is an absolute truth. It's also the case that some teach error. 
Though there is a truth and it is knowable and it's absolute, nonetheless, there are brethren who teach error. Galatians 1.7 said there are some who trouble you and want to distort the gospel of Christ. So the real gospel, the truth is being distorted. The people are being troubled by this. And maybe you think back in your Old Testament to Joshua and the time when Achan was said to trouble the people. There's some truth to that, I think. But it has a more, um, I guess that's a fairly remote reference if you're looking at troubling the people, but it has a more immediate reference too, which we'll get to. But though there is truth and though truth is knowable, you're going to have some who teach error anyway, because the truth is it's not an academic exercise. It's not an intellectual problem. It's a heart problem. They don't love the truth. That's the problem. Always is. The next thing that he makes an example of in that eighth verse, even if we or an angel from heaven should preach a gospel contrary, let him be accursed. We, is Paul and his companions, that is to say, the apostles, if the apostles themselves begin to preach a gospel that is contrary to the one that they have received already, that's been delivered to them, as in Paul admits that he could teach error. He could leave the faith. And his admonition is, even if I do that, even if an angel from heaven makes an appearance to you and says something, and it's contrary to the gospel, you let him be accursed. Accursed, you may know, is the word anathema, which means written up. Um, not written up in a brotherhood magazine, but written up on a wanted poster. That's what it means, literally. <laughs> so this person is condemned. This person is going on without you. You will not be an accomplice to their crime. Don't join the apostles in sin. If the apostles are sinning, don't join them. If an angel from heaven appears and calls you to something that's not the gospel, don't join them. And then in the ninth verse, the reason for the repetition is not mere redundancy, which I do love since I used to work in the Department of Redundancy Department. But the purpose of the repeat repetition there in verse 8 I'm sorry, at verse 9, is to put it locally. At verse 8, he said, If we or an angel from heaven preach a contrary gospel, let them go on without you. But in verse 9, if anyone is preaching to you a gospel contrary, meaning if anybody there in Galatia is teaching this, not just the apostles or some other outside force, but some local person is teaching and preaching a gospel that's contrary. Let him be accursed. Don't join in what's happening there. Don't hold hands with that. And anathema is a, is a study all to itself as to giving names and making them public, which people seem to be very much against, unless it involves, you know, a faithful brother whom we wish to malign. Then we can do it freely. But everybody else, you're not allowed to use names. That's rude. Yet the gospel shows that they did this exactly. He's referring to a wanted poster. That person should be known, identified. You know, people should be warned that they're teaching a contrary gospel. That should be known. But anyway, it's a whole study to itself. As we keep going through the principles being laid out, the 10th verse said, Am I now seeking the approval of man or of God. Yeah, there's a commendation, according to Hebrews 11, when he speaks of faith and the commendation that comes by faith. That commendation comes not from man, but from God. Which one are we looking for? Whose approval do we seek in this church? We're we looking for what seems like a good idea to the members or what might look good to people that we think will visit or what you know might 
look good on a YouTube channel or website or whatever? Are we looking for the approval of man or are we looking to do what God wants us to do? Are we looking to fulfill the commandment of God? Which one is it? Whose commendation are we looking for? Do we need to have people saying that this is good and patting us on the back, or are we looking for the approval that comes from God? Now, I hope that brethren will be encouraging, and I think that you will find faithful brethren will be encouraging. But that's not, that's not the basis of truth, and that's not why we're doing it. We're looking for the approval of God. That's what needs to be sought. Truth is based on God, not on the people. What the people need, whether they're young or whether they are old, you know, whether they are married or whether they are single, whatever the different marketing segments of population people want to divide the church into, what they all need, what every one of us needs, is the approval of God. We all need the truth. We all need the Bible. That's what they need. And finally, from my way of dicing this up, uh, in Galatians 1, verse 10, he said, if I were still trying to please man, am I trying to please man? If I were, I wouldn't be a servant of Christ. You get to pick one. You can serve God or you can serve man. You don't get to have both. That's how it works. You get to pick one. You don't get both of them. What is it going to be? Whose servant will I be? The servant of Christ or the servant of man? So this is the, these are the principles, and I think that these principles serve us very well towards the major perspective that we have to prevent error and we have to be on guard as well against personalities having the sway and the save instead of God and his word having the sway and the say. It certainly does happen. It's a real thing. And there's a reason why he warns them. And in fact, it's rather precise in this letter. He's referring to a, a specific circumstance that happened in their knowledge Perhaps where they were, I'm not sure. But they, um, he's referring to something that happened between, you know, I guess, between Peter and James, the apostles, and uh, what happened, uh, and, and, and between, well, between the apostles and, and the rest of the brethren who are not Jews, the Gentiles, as they're called. Although the original word that gets translated Gentiles just means the ethnicities or the nations, you know, implying not the nation of Israel, the other nations, the other ethnicities, not the Israelites. But um, there was a problem there. And it is recorded in Galatians 2. But the thing that I w want to point out before we get into that is to understand the framework, Paul gave us, or gave them, the principles guiding what ought to be done when somebody who should know better, who should be in authority, begins to speak error. He gave those principles, now he's going to make application, but the context, the structure, is Acts chapter 15. He's looking back at what happened as recorded in that chapter. Uh, I can establish this. You know that that's true by looking at the opening of Galatians 2, where he said in the first couple of verses, after 14 years, that is, 14 years of being an apostle, after the Lord appeared to him, as recorded in Acts 9, it was 14 years later that he went up to Jerusalem, which is Acts 15. There's 14 years between Acts 9 and Acts 15. That's what's, what this means. I went up to Jerusalem with Barnabas. I took Titus along too. I went up because of a revelation and set before them, though privately, before those who seemed influential, I set before them the gospel that I proclaim among the nations in order to make sure I was not running or had not run in vain. 
So it's 14 years after he has become a Christian and has become an apostle. He's preaching the gospel among the nations for 14 years before he goes to Jerusalem in Acts 15. When he goes to Jerusalem in Acts 15, it's because of a revelation, he said. What do we mean? We mean that the Lord told him to go, so he went. Why say that? Because he's not subject to them. He's an apostle, and they are apostles. He doesn't answer to them. They don't summon him. It doesn't work like that. He doesn't have to go to Jerusalem. He's teaching the Gentiles. He's teaching the truth about the application of the law of Moses. He doesn't have to go to Jerusalem to get that. He received what he is teaching directly from Jesus by revelation. Why is he telling them this? You see why, don't you? He doesn't want them to think that Jerusalem pulls rank. Because that's what leads to a belief that you have to be circumcised to be saved. That's what he's trying to get across to them. This came by revelation from the Lord. This was not subject to Jerusalem. It's not Jewish. And when he went, he set before them the gospel he has already been proclaiming 14 years. Now we go back to Acts 15. It's clear this is what he's talking about. What happened in Acts 15? Well, this is what happened. Take the first three verses with me. Some men came down from Judea and were teaching the brothers... They came down from Judea to um, Antioch, Syria. Uh, They began to teach, and they came down from Judea, meaning they came from Jerusalem environs and began to teach, unless you are circumcised according to the custom of Moses, you cannot be saved. And after Paul and Barnabas... Remember Galatians one, uh, 2, verse 1, he went up and took Barnabas with him. Paul and Barnabas, Acts 15, 2, had no small dissension and debate with them. After which, Paul and Barnabas and some of the others were appointed to go up to Jerusalem to the apostles and the elders about this matter. They being sent on their way by the church, passed through different nations, relaying to them what all had been done and brought great joy to the brothers. That's Acts 15, verses 1 through 3. But you see how it is. You had some who came from Jerusalem environs. What does that mean? It means that they have an air of authority. They're leaving the impression that they were sent by the apostles or that they represent maybe the purest form of the teaching because it's the origin in Jerusalem. And that Paul's is more of a you know, wild-grown teaching uh, away from the center of Jerusalem. Well, Paul and Barnabas already knew what the truth was and deb- debated them on this. Were already no small dissension means no, they didn't put up with this. They did not allow this to happen. But they couldn't get it to stop locally in that congregation. And when the Lord gave Paul an, uh, a revelation to go on to Jerusalem, the church agreed to send him. And they went. Not because Paul had some question about this. He didn't. When you look at this chapter, Acts 15, uh, and what happens here, which is very often called the Jerusalem Council, um, which I think is a funny name. And uh, of course, that word never occurs in the text. That's all being superimposed upon it by human thought and reason. That doesn't exist. The truth is they gathered for two reasons in Jerusalem. 
First, they wanted to establish what is the best way to teach the fact that there is unity in Christ Jesus between Jew and Gentile. How do you teach this? How do you approach this? What do you say? The other thing is, how do we stop these guys who are teaching opposite? What do we need to do to stop this? These are the actual questions in Acts 15 that they gathered to discuss. What is the best way to teach this unity and what is the best way to stop the false teachers on this matter? And when you read Acts 15, you find out that the best way to teach this unity is to apply the Old Testament accurately. Interpret the prophets, interpret the Psalms, the things that are written there. This is what Peter and James respond when you look at their responses here. That you use the scriptures, you use them accurately, make an appropriate application of the uh, foretelling and the, and the patterns that occur there. But the answer for false teachers is they're going to send personal representatives from the Jerusalem environments and they're going to send a letter as well. The letter being carried by their personal representatives names Paul directly so that this is the way they decided to deal with it. They're sealing it. You know, we would, they couldn't get them to stop in Antioch They went to Jerusalem, the apostles gave additional ways, additional readings of the Old Testament as ways to apply and understand the truth about this, and the apostles also undercut their claim to authority based on the fact that they came from Jerusalem by sending personal representatives and a letter. That's how they did, dealt with this matter. That's what they decided to do. That is what they did. That's what you're reading in Acts 15. And let me say this, Acts 15 is not a debate about whether Gentiles are included, as if anybody had that question. No apostle had a question about that, period, end of story. That was not a debate in Acts 15. That was not a question. Nobody thought the Gentiles were not included. Only the false teachers thought that. No apostle thought that. That's not what this is about. As if they got together, they had some doctrinal difference about whether Gentiles were included. And so they hosted a debate. And these guys took this proposition, and these guys took that proposition, and that settled the matter. And that's why they decided that, yeah, we're going to go ahead and let the Gentiles be part of the church. Hogwash. That's hogwash. Why do people want that? Because it's what they do. But what people do has nothing to do with what the Bible teaches. The Bible should dictate. You say, but what about the people who do that? Well, we'll deal with that later. But the Bible never says anything like that, never produces anything like that. It's not there. This was commanded in Acts 10. Remember when Peter went to the house of the Roman Cornelius and the Lord appeared to him in a vision multiple times, a repeated vision, saying, what has been cleansed you must not call common or unclean. What little debate there was about this matter was when Peter went back to Jerusalem and they said, hey, you went into the Gentiles. And he told them what happened. That's Acts 11. And we already read how that Paul had been teaching the same thing for some 14 years. So between, you know, Peter coming to understand by revelation in Acts 10, the rest of the brothers understanding that when he gets back to Jerusalem in Acts 11, and uh, Paul having taught this since Acts 9. There's no question about whether the Gentiles are included. That's never been a question. Galatians 1, 
At verse 15, he said, when, when he who had set me apart before I was born and called me by his grace was pleased to reveal his son to me in order that I might preach him among the nations, the Gentiles, I did not immediately consult with anyone else, nor did I go up to Jerusalem to those who were apostles before me. Rather, I went away from here into Arabia and returned again to Damascus. Yeah, Paul didn't go to Jerusalem to get any more information. From the very beginning, he knew that. Even in Acts 15, when Peter talks about this, he talks about it in retrospect. You read there in the seventh verse, after there had been much debate, Peter stood up and said, isn't that an amazing thing? Where have I seen Peter stood up and said... Ah, yes, Acts chapter 2, right? He keeps doing this. Is it inspired? Yep. Is it the truth? Yep. That's why it's recorded here. Brothers, you know that in the early days, God made a choice among you that by my mouth, the Gentiles should hear the word of the gospel and believe. The early days, that's Acts 10. And God, who knows the heart, bore witness to them by giving them the Holy Spirit, just as he did to us. And he made no distinction between us and them, having cleansed their hearts by faith. When Peter speaks about this, he speaks in retrospect. That was well settled way back there in Acts 10. And like I said, when you go back to Acts 11... You see what happened when he got back to Jerusalem. They were mad at him for having gone in to the Gentiles and spoke with them, spoken with them, which they had considered the wrong thing to do. But the Lord told him, told them, as I, and Peter said, as I began to speak, the Holy Spirit fell on them just as he had on us at the beginning. That wasn't a normal occurrence, you see. What happened in Acts 10 at the household of Cornelius had only happened once before in Acts chapter 2 with the apostles. And I remembered the word of the Lord, how he said, John baptized with water, but you will be baptized with the Holy Spirit. If then God gave the same gift to them as he gave to us when we believed in the Lord Jesus Christ, who was I that I could stand in God's way? And when they heard these things, they fell silent and glorified God, saying, then to the Gentiles too, God has granted repentance that leads to life. Everybody in Jerusalem knew this already. That was already being spoken. That's no question. So that's the first thing that needs to be set in order. Now, the other thing that you notice in Acts 15 when you start reading this is that nothing changes. There's no doctrinal change. Not only is it not a question about whether Gentiles are included, as if that's a new thing and has to be settled, and now it's permanently settled by some human debate. Hogwash. There's actually no doctrinal change whatsoever in the thing that's happening there. Because it's not a debate about doctrine. The doctrine was never in question. It's a, deba- it's a debate about method. What's the best way to approach the teaching? What's the best way to approach the false teachers? That's what they were gathered for. You notice that when Paul and Barnabas got up there, Acts 15, when they arrived in Jerusalem, the record of Acts 15 verse 4 says, When they came up to Jerusalem, they were welcomed by the church and the apostles and the elders and declared all that God had done with them, which is to say the prior 14 years of preaching the gospel among the nations. They were welcomed by the church, the apostles, the elders. Their doctrine was not tweaked, was not changed. They were welcomed. And back in Galatians 2, when Paul is talking about having gone to Jerusalem and spoken to these pillars of the faith, the other apostles, he said that they added nothing to me. There was no change to the doctrine. When he's saying they added nothing to me, he didn't mean, I don't need those guys. He meant there was no doctrinal change here. Nothing got added. There was no supplement like, oh yeah, that's pretty good, Paul. You did that all by yourself. 
you know, way to go. And let us help you by building up this other thing. No, that's not what happened. <laughs> they added nothing. They were in complete accord. There in Galatians chapter 2, verse 9, he said, These apostles, James, Cephas, that's Peter, and John, gave us the right hand of fellowship. So they're in fellowship. They're in embrace. And back there in Acts 15, in the letter that they decided to send to the Gentiles, they said as well that they were sending, at verse 27, Silas, Judas and Silas, who will tell you the same things by word of mouth. So they're ratifying it by sending witnesses and a letter. There's no change there, you see. They're in complete agreement. It's all identical. That's not the thing that's happening in Acts 15. Rather, they are stamping out the error. Remember in Acts 15, 1 and 2 that we read that this started in Antioch when Paul and Barnabas are dealing with false teachers who came from Jerusalem claiming that they had authority because they were from Jerusalem, trying to teach that circumcision was necessary for salvation, that it's a part of the plan of salvation. Not enough to be baptized, you have to be circumcised too. That's false. That was never taught by the apostles. In fact, once they arrived in Jerusalem, Acts 15.5 records, some believers who belonged to the party of the Pharisees rose up and said, it's necessary to circumcise these Gentiles who have obeyed the gospel and to order them to keep the law of Moses. That was their position. And in Galatians 2, Paul characterizes that. It wasn't that he himself had been teaching this. It wasn't that anybody in Jerusalem who was an apostle before him had been teaching this. Where did it come from? Galatians 2 verse 4. Because of false brothers secretly brought in who slipped in to spy out our freedom that we have in Christ Jesus so that they might bring us into slavery. To them, we did not yield in submission even for a moment so that the truth of the gospel might be preserved for you. So Paul said this was never tolerated at any point in time. We did not go along with that for a moment. From the time they landed at Antioch, we didn't put up with that. We went to Jerusalem fighting them. And when we got to Jerusalem, our doctrine was the doctrine of the apostles. Why well, say that? Because... <laughs> Right? Because that's what's happening in Galatia. Remember that letter, Acts 15, that they decided to send? It is recorded for us in 23 to 29. The brothers, both the apostles and the elders, to the brothers who are of the Gentiles in Antioch, Syria, Cilicia, greetings. First thing that they do here is to make the Paul co-equal with the Judean apostles. You notice it's not the apostles to you guys and to Paul. No, Paul is one of the apostles, one of the brothers in Judea, one of the apostles. He's not an elder. He's not married. He has no children. He's an apostle. And they said, the brothers to the brothers, as in they, the apostles and the elders of the church in Jerusalem, are co-equal to the Gentiles who have obeyed the gospel. They're all brothers. It's fairly, very clear, actually, what they've done. And it's beautiful. It's a beautiful thing. Since we've heard that some persons have gone out from us, 
and troubled you with words unsettling your minds, although we gave them no instructions. Hold on for a second. Look at that again. They were claiming authority because they had gone out from Jerusalem. They went out from us and troubled you with words and unsettled your minds. Their minds have been made up in Christ Jesus, and these people showed up to turn things upside down, to cause trouble among the brethren. And they said, although we gave them no instructions. That settles it. Everybody who came down from Jerusalem and claimed to have authority teaching this kind of thing was not sent. Everybody who did that is a false teacher. They did not receive any such instruction from the apostles. That's what this is doing. It's making it very clear. You now know because you have a letter from the apostles and personal witnesses and Paul's name in it that what Paul was teaching was exactly what the apostles in Jerusalem teach and that they never sent anybody to say any such thing. What do you know? That means that everybody saying that is wrong. Everybody saying that is a false teacher and you know it. That's what that means. It's very useful. They said, in view of this, Acts 15, verse 25, it seemed good to us, having come to one accord, to choose men and send them to you with our beloved Barnabas and Paul, men who have risked their lives for the name of our Lord Jesus Christ. We have therefore sent Judas and Silas, who themselves will tell you the same things by word of mouth, for it seemed good to the Holy Spirit and to us too, to lay on you no greater burden than these requirements that you abstain from uh, what has been sacrificed to idols, from blood, and from what has been strangled, from sexual immorality. If you keep the, yourself from these things, you do well. Farewell. Now, some want to say that these are new requirements. They are not. This is just a way of describing idolatrous worship in the Roman Empire. They're just saying, you leave the old world. You're out of that world. You're gone. We don't participate in the old religions. The decision was to choose men and send them. There was no question as to whether these Gentiles were brethren. The question was, what are we going to do about the false teachers and their influence? And what are we going to do about Jerusalem being marshaled as evidence? I'd like to leave you with some thoughts here in Galatians 1 and 2 and the passages that we're looking at. I'd like to leave you with some thoughts here. This is, these are closing remarks. But what is Galatians really? The big picture is a call to obedience, but especially verses 1 and 2 with reference to Acts 15 are about taking a principled stance for the truth the truth that was always with the apostles and didn't change over time and had no dependency upon uh, location, you know, background, upbringing. None of these things has anything to do with truth. The letter in Acts 15.24 said, some persons have gone out from us and troubled you. And that's where Paul started in Galatians 1, 7, remember? There's not really another gospel, but there are some who trouble you and are trying to distort the gospel of Christ. So why is he calling Acts 15 to memory? Why is he reminding them of what happened there and providing his perspective on that event when he's writing Galatia? Well, because it's reminding them of the principles that they are to stand upon. It's teaching us how to stand. What do you do about this? Let them be accursed is to say, they're going to go without me. I'm not going to lay hands to that. I'm not going to join in with that. I'm not going to say that that's okay. In fact, I'm going to identify that as wrong and take my stand apart from that. That's what we're called to. And finally, the thing that Paul says in the conclusion 
of his letter to Galatia. It's very important. The 14th down to the 16th verses and the lesson is yours. Galatians 6, 14 to 16. Far be it from me, says Paul, to boast, except in the cross of our Lord Jesus Christ, by which the world has been crucified to me and I to the world. For neither circumcision counts for anything nor uncircumcision, but a new creation. And as for all who walk by this rule, peace and mercy be upon them, upon the Israel of God. The new creation is Christ Jesus. You becoming a Christian when you obey the gospel of Jesus by being baptized in his name, you are repentant. You have put to death the old person of sin and are buried together with him that you might be resurrected together with him. And that resurrection is described in the letters as a new creation. You have been created in Christ Jesus for good works, which God prepared beforehand that we should walk in them. Ephesians chapter 2 and verse 10 says that. That whether we're circumcised or not circumcised, you know, whatever nation we come from or whoever our parents are is irrelevant. These mean nothing in Christ. What means something is a new creation, that you repented from your old life and your old sins and you were buried together with Christ in baptism for forgiveness and are now a new creature created in him. You're a Christian now. That's the real Israel of God. That's the real nation of faith. And as Paul said, peace be upon it. Let your mind be at peace. The apostle said, it's too bad really that people came out from here claiming authority as Judeans and troubled you and unsettled your minds. Paul said, you can have peace. And you do in Christ Jesus. And in the love of the truth. All right. Well, that's the first shoe to drop. We'll talk at another opportunity about the rest of the story in Galatians 2. But for now, if you have not obeyed the gospel, we've read a number of passages already that talk about what that takes. And I'll remind you that we have water here prepared that you might be baptized in Christ's name for forgiveness. We'll be glad to help you. If you are a Christian and haven't lived right, repent. Put God first again. Let us pray with you that you might be strengthened in your resolve. If you need today the prayers of the saints or you need to obey the gospel, let that need be known now by coming to the front while we stand and sing.